Good morning and welcome to the Angry Astronaut, the first day that we've had since the triumphant static fire that took place with SpaceX. And uh, I have to admit, I was just overcome with excitement yesterday. I'm sure those of you who tuned in to my live stream noticed that. But that having been said, in the aftermath, I had some questions. The whole thing just didn't seem to be quite as loud as I expected that it would be. Now, a friend of mine told me that that was to be expected, that the Raptors are not really all that loud after all, and 33 of them don't produce really a whole lot more noise than one of them. Or at least that's what he said. I remained unconvinced, and as I researched the situation throughout the night, it came to my attention in an article written by Tesla Rati, which, by the way, is a very, very pro-SpaceX periodical, that what happened yesterday, although a huge milestone for SpaceX, may not have been the record-setting event that we all thought it was. Now, of course, a record was set yesterday, but was it a record in every sense of the word? That is to say, just how powerful were those engines? Just how much did they have the throttle dialed up on those things? And in the end, was it really more powerful than the N1 rocket at full power when it took off on its various fateful voyages back in the late 60s and early 70s? First of all, let's check out a quick clip consisting of both the 11-engine static fire and the 31-engine static fire that took place. In one of the images, you're going to see the 11-engine static fire. In the other image, it's going to be the 31-engine static fire. I'm not going to tell you which one it is, and then also... In one of the clips, I have the volume turned on for the 11 engine static fire. And in the other clip, I have the volume turned on for the 31 engine static fire. So what do you think? Was it the large image or the small image that had the 31 engine static fire? Was it the first clip that had the volume on for the big static fire or was it the second clip? Well, you're gonna find out at the end of this video and you're also gonna find out why a second static fire may be necessary before the FAA gives a thumbs up to Starship on its first orbital flight. So as you can see, I was obviously very impressed with what I saw at Boca Chica yesterday and very, very excited. And no matter what happened yesterday, this was a huge milestone for SpaceX because they tested the propulsion system on Super Heavy and it worked. Now, in my opinion, it would be a very good idea to test that very complicated and powerful propulsion system at a dialed down level of throttle rather than full power, which again is probably what they did yesterday. The Raptor 2 engine can be dialed down to 40% power, and if it was fired at that level, or even at 50% power, it did not break N1's record for the most powerful rocket to ever be fired in history. However, regardless of what happened, it did break a record in terms of the most powerful test ever carried out on the stand, and all 
also the most engines ever lit on a single rocket in human history. So a huge milestone regardless. However, it seems very clear to me that SpaceX did not test those engines at anything close to full power, which explains why the noise wasn't as intense and why it's actually a little bit difficult to tell the difference between an 11 engine static fire and a 31 engine static fire. And of course, it must also be remembered that SpaceX chose to shut down one of those engines prior to the static fire, and then one of them gave out on its own during the static fire. And the static fire only lasted for about five seconds. So how does this compare to the ill-fated Soviet N1? And by the way, we compare N1 to Starship on a regular basis simply because this was a rocket powered by liquid fuels, no solid rocket boosters whatsoever, which again is like Saturn V as well, but not like Saturn V in terms of the number of engines it has. It has 30 engines, very similar to Starship's 33, and it had more thrust, at least in in theory than Saturn V did as well, nearly 10 million pounds worth of thrust. And interestingly enough, the second stage of N1, the Block B, had similar capabilities to what Starship has today. Eight NK-15V engines instead of six Raptor engines, but 3.16 million pounds worth of thrust as opposed to 3.2 million pounds of thrust for Starship. So once again, similar capabilities, although N1 had a third stage and a fourth stage to allow it to reach the moon, whereas Starship does not have that capability unless you refuel it. So when it comes right down to it, N1, with its 95 metric ton payload capability to low Earth orbit, is very similar to what Starship is today. Would have been interesting to see this thing actually successfully fly. Well, it did fly, it just didn't get to space. Although, like the test we saw yesterday, the failures of N1 were preceded by a number of engine failures pretty much right after launch. A few seconds after ignition, with the first N1 launch attempt, there was an engine shutdown, engine number 12, caused by an electrical problem, and after that, they shut down engine number 24 in order to maintain symmetrical thrust. However, six seconds after launch, the number two engine tore several components off their mounts and started a propellant leak. At 25 seconds after launch, further vibrations ruptured a fuel line and caused RP-1, or kerosene to spill into the aft section of the booster. At that point, they made a decision 68 seconds after launch to shut down the entire first stage of the rocket, but it did manage to get 52 kilometers away from the launch pad. So in order to have broken N1's record of approximately 10 million pounds worth of thrust, the 31 engines on Starship Super Heavy that actually did fire would have had to have been throttled at about 64%, and perhaps they were, but we really don't know for certain. It's entirely possible that they were throttled less than that in order to test the entire propulsion system without putting unnecessary strain on the system and the booster. If that was the case, then Starship didn't break N1's propulsion record yesterday, and that would explain why SpaceX and Elon Musk have not mentioned anything about breaking that record and instead have simply stuck to the number of engines that were successfully fired. However, there have been some SpaceX engineers who are maintaining right now that the record was broken. But if that were the case, as Tesla Rati points out, that's something that SpaceX and Elon Musk should be crowing from the rooftops today. And they aren't. Again, leading me to think that SpaceX may have played it safe yesterday and fired the engines at a significantly reduced level of throttle. Once again, don't know yet. Hopefully, we'll find out a little bit later in the day or over the course of the next week or so, but there's something else that's very interesting to note. SpaceX has announced road closures for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday next week. 
What do they have in mind? Are they going to move the booster in preparation for an orbital launch, or do they have more static fires planned at higher levels of throttle now that they know that the propulsion system works? Because to be quite honest, I don't believe yesterday's static fire is sufficiently successful to warrant an FAA launch license approval. There were two engine failures in just a few seconds worth of operation. Granted, it could have made it to orbit on 31 engines no problem, but what if there were more engine failures over the course of the next 20 or 30 seconds leading to an anomaly? Oh yeah, and in case you're curious as to which of the clips showed the 31 engine static fire, well, here it is. So the 31 engine static fire was in the larger of the two frames and the volume for the static fire was turned on for the second clip, not for the first. How did you do? Put it in the comments and don't lie. And also don't forget to like this video, don't forget to subscribe, and also check out the description for various ways to support my content if you'd like me to head to Houston and see what new things have been introduced at the Johnson Space Center over the course of the last year and a half. So back to the static fire. Why do I think that it's going to be necessary to have another static fire carried out before the FAA is going to give the go ahead? Well, I think the FAA would be more more reassured if they had a successful static fire at a higher level of throttle without any engine failures. Now, they may still approve it even with engine failures if they actually carry it out somewhere closer to the amount of throttle that we can expect prior to a launch. But regardless of the specifics, what happened yesterday was a huge milestone for SpaceX. They demonstrated that a 33-engine propulsion system is is viable and it can work. Yes, there were a couple of minor problems, but if that's all the problems they experience with this propulsion system, Starship will make it to orbit without any problem whatsoever, with the capability of carrying a tremendous amount of payload with it. Really, very little needs to be done at this point before an orbital launch attempt can take place. In my opinion, SpaceX will probably proceed with one or two more static fires dialing up the throttle gradually to make sure that the propulsion system and the launch pad can handle all of the punishment. But once they do that, and I have every confidence that it will be successful, it'll be time for an orbital launch and for my ass to be on the line with that SpaceX fanboy tattoo. Although remember, I won't be getting that tattoo unless I have 100,000 subscribers, hence the 100k challenge. Oh yeah, and I've got some 100k merchandise with Team Vulcan and Team Starship linked in the description. Don't forget to check that out. And until this ship finally does take to orbit and transform human spaceflight forever, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.